yours. <clears throat> Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Uh, Lord, I ask that you just come and join us this morning, that you guide us as you so see fit, that you pour out your mercy upon our heads. Lord, we praise you um, for the uh, millions and billions of things that you are sustaining in our lives to keep um, things afloat, Lord, but most especially, uh, we thank you for um, how you've been treating our brother, friend, uh, spouse for some of us, fathers for others, other, others of us. Uh, we just praise you for what you've been doing there. Lord, we ask that you continue to sustain him. Uh, Lord, we recognize that he's not the only one wrestling with COVID, and um, the Bradshaws are not the only family going through this. We ask that you uh, be the peace and patience of all of the families going through this same battle. Lord, this week we jump, uh, a lot of our students and teachers um, jump back into school. So Lord, we just ask that you um, bless them this week, that you give them peace and patience, that uh, it'd be an exciting time and allow them to navigate the challenges um, of this season well and uh, enjoy and glorify you and all we do. Please loosen my tongue to uh, share what you would have us uh, see about yourself this morning. We love you. Come and guide us as you so see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> if you've been with us at Summit for the past month and a half, two months, you'll recall that we're in a, we call it a new sermon series, but I think it's actually probably, probably better described as a lecture series, as we're jumping through a series we call Theology 101. Today, we're landing in the realm of soteriology. If you haven't been with us for the past couple weeks, uh, we've been in this, this is part three of our series, but soteriology is actually the study of, or the doctrine surrounding salvation. That's what we're talking about this morning, but in order to appreciate how we got here and what it is, we'll talk a little bit about where we've been uh, and how we got to where we are today. We first started out this series by talking about theology proper. That's the study of God himself, specifically studying the nature of God. We looked at the Trinity. We looked at the attributes of God. We first started out by talking about the nature of God, and then we transitioned our conversation to the nature of man, not theology proper, but anthropology. We were in there for about two weeks to talk about the nature of man is to also talk about the nature of sin, because who we are is now post-fall sinful, wretched creatures, as you saw as we talked through anthropology and the problem of man. Now we <clears throat> are jumping into soteriology. The reason we do that is because the nature of man begs the question or talks about the nature of sin, which begs the question, if sin is our problem, what is our solution? And that's when we start to talk about salvation. Specifically, soteriology, this is part three, the doctrine of salvation. Uh, buckle up, buttercup, because it's going to be a bumpy ride as we get through this morning. Um, <clears throat> as we talked about last week, if you weren't with us last week, I'd encourage you, I'll be uploading uh, last week's sermon later today or early tomorrow morning. Uh, if today is at all confusing for you or you get a little bit lost, I'd encourage you to take a look at last week's message as we really unpack the bulk of this. This is almost a follow-up message on what we were talking about last week, so if you're confused, feel free to check that one out. Uh, but if you were with us last week, we essentially answered the question, what is salvation? When does salvation occur? Who is involved in salvation? How does it come about? And why are we saved at the end of the day? If you're with us last week, we talked about the what, when, who, how, and why of salvation. Um, and we said that there's perhaps no better place to answer that question than Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Uh, in theology, you're typically looking at the totality of Scripture as it weighs in on a particular doctrine. Uh, last week, we said there's a lot of text. We're just going to boil it down to one. We're just going to glean from Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, which is where we're going to be again this morning. So what I'd like to do for us this morning is actually read for us Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And as we read through this verse, especially if you were not with us last week, I'd encourage you to ask yourself, what is salvation? When does salvation occur? Who all is involved in salvation? How does it happen and why does it happen? Uh, as those questions are answered in this text. Let's take a look at the text. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 reads like this. This is Paul writing to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, that is Christ, we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he has lavished on us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth in him that is Christ we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. If you were with us last week, what we did is we walked through that text and we showed how this answered, what is salvation? When does salvation occur? How does salvation manifest itself? Who is involved in salvation? And ultimately, why are we saved? We don't have time to draw that out from the text this morning. We're just going to summarize it in one sentence. If we were to summarize the what, when, who, how, and why of salvation, at least according to Ephesians, which is a pretty good representation of all of Scripture, it would answer the question like this. Salvation is undeserving sinners being saved from God to God through God and by God, for God, when and how God desires. A good working definition for our purposes this morning on salvation is this. Salvation is undeserving sinners being saved from God, being saved specifically from the wrath of God to God, being saved from the wrath of God to the person of God himself for all eternity. Through God, that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By God, that's God doing all the work on our behalf. For God, for the praise of his glorious grace, when and how God desires. Now, if you were with us last week, this definition and what we looked at in Ephesians begs a handful of questions uh, of us to get us to wrestle with uh, what is salvation and how does it work. Here are a handful of those different questions, but some of the questions we ask when it comes to soteriology are like, uh, soteriology is all about salvation, it's all about being saved. So one of our questions is, uh, you may have wrestled with this, is it it once saved, always saved? If I believed, but then I reject, but then I believe again, have I lost my salvation in the meantime and then I acquire it again? How does that whole thing work? Uh, This soteriology begs the question about, um, what about the innocent child on a mountain in Tibet who's never heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that individual saved. Uh, In the Ephesians text, we saw the word predestination. What does that word mean? How does that play out? Uh, What about free will? What about evangelism? Uh, Do I need to believe? Is it all done by God? How does this whole thing work? Uh, How do I account for, if I'm a believer, present sin in my life? Um, Is it possible for... uh, What about uh, another question we wrestle with is, uh, what about those who sincerely believe in other faiths? I mean, we all know other believers, not in Christ, but other believers in other faiths who are sincere in their belief. What about them? Are they saved at the end of the day? Has their grace given to them as well? Uh, All these questions uh, are related to soteriology, and it's our hope this morning that we at least address some of them. Um, The way in which we'll answer these questions is by talking about the order of salvation. What is the process of salvation? Now, in order for this maybe illustration to work, Um, I want you to suppose for just a minute that you, this is assuming that this is you, and this is assuming that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Okay, This is you, and for the sake of my illustration today, you are going to be, have you seen one of those lots, especially in the drought? Uh, Have you seen one of those, these yards, or one of these vacant lots in Enterprise, although there's they're very few and they're far overpriced, but the vacant lots (laughs) here in Enterprise, and there's weeds that have grown up, and it's infested the, you know, the yard, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you've heard rumors that, uh, you know, there was uh, toxic waste at some point poured out on that yard. And I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a lot that's uh, corrupt to the core. It's, it's soil is eroding. The soil is toxic. Uh, there's weeds everywhere. I want you to imagine for a minute that you are that yard, okay? For the purpose of this morning to make our station maybe go smoothly, even though it's not going smoothly now. Uh, you are a weed-infested, utterly corrupt yard. We're getting that from anthropology where we talked about the nature of man being utterly corrupt to the core. You are a weed-infested, toxic soil level, soil eroding yard here in the county. And not only that, you are indebted to your master because you've fallen behind on payments and you owe an infinite debt. Okay, you guys are tracking with me. All right, that's our illustration for this morning. It'll just maybe help us later down the road. 
That is you. That is the problem. Uh, what is the process of you, therefore, being saved or redeemed as a weed-infested, toxic yard? Uh, this is what Scripture points to. There are four major chunks in our salvation, four major, process, four major steps in the process of salvation, if you will. Now, to be fair, before we go through these four, I'll share with you, there are other steps in this where, uh, you know, creation and fall plays into this. The hearing of the word, the calling of the believers, the regeneration of someone when they believe, the uh, pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon that person, upon belief. Uh, there's the perseverance of the saints until they die. There's death. But for today's purpose, we're just going to boil it down to these four right here. Four major stages or steps in the process of you being saved. You, a weed-infested, toxic, soil-leveled, soil corrosion, utterly indebted yard here in the county. That is who you are. This is how God has redeemed you. It first starts out with something called election. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that word. Another word for this is predestination. But what we see reflected in Ephesians is essentially what election means is that means that God, before the foundation of the world, chooses the people that he is going to redeem. God in the holy eternal huddle gets together and says, we are going to redeem a people. Who are we going to redeem? And he chooses in that moment. We'll demonstrate how we see that in scripture here in just a minute. That's the first part of salvation. The next part is justification. This is typically what we think of when we think of the forgiveness of sin. This is what happened on the cross when Jesus Christ, after living the life that you and I should have lived, he then died the death that you and I should have died. He went up on the cross, and on that cross, he paid for the sins of those who would believe in him. Uh, this is God driving by your yard and saying, I'm going to buy that lot. I'm going to purchase that piece of property. That piece of property is mine. Now, the difference between you and I is when we drive by a lot and we say, I'm going to buy that piece of property. You just hope that someone hasn't already put an offer on it. You just hope that the price is right. You've got to work with your realtor. You've got to make sure that it's going to work, that the zoning works. But when God decides he's going to buy something, God is going to buy something. So what God has done in the holy eternal huddle of time is he essentially added certain people to his cart. And one day he was going to go and buy those people. Election is God. <clears throat> saying he's going to redeem some, justification is him, is him actually going to purchase that field. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But not only does God uh, choose his people and God redeems his people on the cross, but God begins refining his people. That's what we oftentimes refer to as sanctification. This is God has said he's going to buy the field. This is God forking over the money, purchasing that field, putting it under his name, and now he begins the process of weeding it out, if you will. He shows up with a rake and a shovel and some weed killer, and he starts working on the process of redeeming that. That's called sanctification. That is what he's doing in between you being saved and you heading to heaven. He is sanctifying or refining your soul. And ultimately, where we're headed, the final step, if you will, in salvation is glorification, which is ultimately God glorifying his people by sharing his glory with them. That's what we all look forward to. Uh, typically, when we think of salvation, we typically think of justification here and glorification here. But scripture wants to draw our attention to all aspects of salvation. There's an order, there's an order to this. There's um, a process to it. Uh, it's all interconnected. It is all <clears throat> what we sometimes refer to as grace. Uh, this is the order of salvation. Now, um, we're going to jump more specifically into each one of these different sections and then ask a few different questions about them. First, let's talk about election. Perhaps the thing we've got the most questions around, which is defined as God choosing his people. If you're not familiar with the word election, I may have already said this, but uh, sometimes this is referred to as predestination. This is sometimes referred to as the doctrines of grace. And essentially what this doctrine says, it's a, um, I'm sorry, what scripture informs is that God and the holy hunter, huddle of eternity has chosen his people whom he will redeem. We just read this in Ephesians 1, uh, 3 through 14. Twice it talks about predestination. Here in this passage we see in 1, 4, it says that he, that is God, chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world. Uh, it later goes on to say, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. And again, in 11, it says, In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. What this doctrine says is what teacher, Scripture teaches when it says that God picks his citizens. He chooses his sheep. He calls them by name, and they come. 
Now, there are many places we could go in Scripture to unpack this more extensively. What I actually want to do is I just want to show you in the Gospel of John, because if you've been with us at Summit, you'll recall that for about a year and a half, we were in the Gospel of John. I just want to show you how we see this doctrine taught all throughout Scripture, but specifically in a book that we just covered. In John's prologue, John 1, 13, it says, For all of those who believed in Christ, who received his word, he gave them the right to become children of God. And then look at this. It says, Who were born... Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What this is communicating to us is when you were saved, it was not that you all of a sudden just decided to choose God, but that before the foundation of the world, he came and chose you, and you're merely responding to him choosing you by you choosing him. Uh, We see this reflected again in John 15 when Jesus literally says to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. We see this again taught in John 6, 44, when Jesus is talking to the crowd and he says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. If you remember in that passage, everyone walks away. Jesus looks at the 12 disciples and he says, everyone's walked away, aren't you guys gonna walk away? Peter says, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And he says, blessed are you, uh, Simon, son of Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Did I not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. Constantly throughout the text of scripture, we see that um, salvation begins with God saying, I'm going to redeem a people. And he chooses who those people are. Um, as we've talked about before at Summit, uh, salvation, is not, salvation is something you receive. It is not something you participate in. It is God running after your soul, capturing you unto himself, bringing you into relationship with him. And only after he's done that, you saying, ah, aha, I see and I believe. We see this uh, in the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Do you remember this? Nicodemus comes to him and he asks him a spiritual question. And basically Jesus says to him, you cannot see spiritual things until you've been born again. The, he literally says um, to Nicodemus, um, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven until you're born again. Remember, born again is drawing upon a metaphor. That metaphor is the process of being born into this world. What Jesus is basically saying is, Nicodemus, you did not make yourself born the first time. You cannot make yourself born the second time. You must believe, and upon your belief, you will realize that it is not you who chose me, but I who chose you. Does this make sense? Um, This is what is taught in Scripture. Now, if you're anything like me, this brings up a handful of different questions that I have. Um, Like, how in the world is this fair? If it is God choosing us and us not choosing God, how in the world is this fair? Uh, What about free will? We're all familiar with this concept of free will, how does that play into this whole thing? Uh, How, if it's all up to God and some people reject God, how does he then still find fault in who we are and what we've done? Uh, Why doesn't God, if it's all up to God, why doesn't God save everyone? Uh, What about innocent people? What about that child on a mountain in Tibet, an innocent person on the other side of the world who never hears the gospel? What about them? What happens to them? Um, What about sincere non-believers? What about belief? How does that factor in this whole thing? And what about evangelism? What are the implications of election? on evangelism. A handful of different questions. We'll start with the first one. How is this fair? If it's God who chooses us and we don't choose him, how is it fair that he chooses some and not others? The answer to that question is, um, it's not fair. It's grace. What you have to understand is, in our relationship with God, we never, ever, ever want fair. Fairness means we perish for eternity. Fairness means that God never sends his son to the cross to die for someone else's sins. In our relationship with God, you never want fair. You want grace. This is not fair. This is gracious. You do not want fair. One thing I've noticed is when human beings start talking about fair, every time we do, we always have our finger on the scales tipping in our favor. Remember the nature of who God is. We said he is perfectly just, he is perfectly righteous. And we, as the creatures, are now looking at him and say, how are you just if you perform this way? Every time we question God's fairness or God's justice, we always have our hands on the scale tipping in our favor. You do not want fair. You want grace. Is this fair? No, it's not. It's gracious. Um, What about free will? if it's all up to God and is literally, this passage is talking about God has an irresistible grace when he reveals himself to someone, they cannot help but accept him. They cannot help but embrace him. Um, what about free will? How does that play into this whole kind of conversation? Uh, if you've been with us some you will recall that scripture does talk about free will. It talks about it a whole ton. But every time it talks about free will, it always talks about God's free will 
and not man's. What we have to understand is um, when we oftentimes talk about free will, we're actually talking about autonomy, the ability to do what you want, when you want, how you want, and be limited by nothing. There's only one person, if you will, who has ultimate free will, who has autonomy. That person is God. When scripture talks about free will, it talks about he can do what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. Uh, man is bound by a thousand things. We're bound by time. We're bound by knowledge. We're bound by maturity. We're bound by circumstance. We're bound by opportunity. We're bound by personality. Uh, we're bound by gravity. Man is bound by a thousand things. He is not free to do as he pleases. Only God is free to do all he pleases. Uh, Psalm 115.3, I think. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Scripture talks about free will, but every time it does, it talks about God's free will. In fact, when Scripture talks about man's will, you know how it describes it? This is the conversation that we all saw in John 8, when Jesus is talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Jews and kind of the Pharisees and that crowd, and he says to them, you are of your father the devil. Your will is to do your father's desires. So do you know how Scripture describes mankind's will? It's not that we're free to do whatever we want and we can make decisions. It's we are bound, our will is bound to do, not even our desires, but our Father's desires. Specifically in this text, we are bound to do the devil's desires. Um, scripture does not talk about man having a free will. It talks about man's will being enslaved to sin and to Satan. That is how it describes us. Um, what we see in Scripture is that if God gave us um, the choice to choose him, we never would. We are enslaved to sin. We are bound in our desires um, to perform Satan's will, not even our own. So when it comes to the question of uh, what about free will, Scripture wants us to know that God is ultimately free. Mankind is bound by a million things, um, but most especially, our will is bound to Satan's desires until God comes and redeems us. If you say, well, that John 8 passage is actually talking to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, um, you know, maybe their wills were bound, but not everyone's wills are bound to Satan. I draw your attention to the fact that what makes a Pharisee a Pharisee? What makes a Pharisee a Pharisee is that they thought they were better than other people. If we look at that text and say, well, I'm not like the Pharisees, I'm a little bit better than they are, we actually prove ourselves to be Pharisees, and our will is very bound um, by sin and Satan. So my encouragement to you is to recognize, we ask the question, what about free will? Um, scripture speaks into free will, and it talks about it, but every time it does, it talks about God being free to do what he wants. Man is bound by a thousand things until God comes and redeems him, gives him a new heart, gives him a new will. That's one of the things that happens in regeneration. Uh, our next question is, well, if it's all up to God and God saves, uh, how does he still find fault in us? A uh, question that scripture would ask of you is, how do you still find fault in God? Uh, we asked the question, maybe the next one, why doesn't God save all people? A better question is, why did God save any in the first place? We look at God, can you, we are the creature saying to the creator, how dare you run your system like this? When Paul addresses this in Romans 9, he says, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Uh, what scripture wants to constantly do is remind us that he is God. If he does it, it is by definition good. And yet we sometimes look at him, we tap our toe and say, I think you could have done that a little bit better. We look at God in Romans 9. Um, we say, how does God still find fault in us uh, if it's all up to him? And what we're actually doing in that moment is we're trying to find a fault in God. And Paul jumps right back, us, back at us and say, he says, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. You're talking to the almighty God. Will you question the way that he chooses to redeem people? How about you just accept the redemption that he's gladly given you? Um, there's more answers to all these questions, but for the sake of time, we'll, we'll keep moving right along. Um, we've been talking about some harsh things, so now we'll talk about something that's good news. You ready? Uh, what about innocent people? What about that innocent man on a mountain in Tibet? Um, is that, and he never, who never hears the gospel, is he saved? Here's some good news and maybe some refreshment for all of us. Yes, innocent people are saved. Um, the person who is innocent, who's never heard the gospel, will be saved. What's the bad news? There are no innocent people. There's no such thing as an innocent man on a mountain somewhere. What we have to understand, and this goes back to hamartiology, the study of sin, is that sin has devastated and corrupted everything. No one is spared from it. 
If you have a low view of sin, you cannot account for the sadness and sorrow that you see in this world. It's about time we start embracing a biblical definition of sin, which says it is horrible and it is everywhere. There is no innocent man on a mountain in Tibet. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, Romans describes it like this, drawing from upon the Psalms. You remember this from two weeks ago. No one is righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and mis misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Yes, if there's an innocent person out there, they will be saved. By God's justice, they will be saved. The problem is, is there are no innocent people. There was one innocent man, and when he came down, what did we do? We slaughtered him. That shows you the corruption in our souls. When finally one of us got it right, we treated him as though he was... Um, the most wrong. Are innocent people saved? Yes, there's only one way to become innocent, through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That ought to break our heart for the man in Tibet who has not heard the gospel, and that ought to motivate us to find a way to get the gospel to him in order that that man on a mountain somewhere might become an innocent man and enter into the glory of God forever. But we have to understand, um, if you have a low view of sin, you will have a low view of salvation. You cannot account for this world or even your own life. You can't account for what the tragic stuff that goes on in our families, in our culture, in our country, around the world right now. You cannot account for it if you have a small view of sin. Sin is everywhere and it's destroyed everything. This is God's way of remedying us. He didn't call to us and say, hey, will you guys choose me? He knew that we wouldn't, so he came in after us, captured our hearts, drug us, many of us, kicking and screaming back unto himself until he opened up our eyes. We saw him for who he was, and we said, my Lord and my God, and we fell at his feet in worship, recognizing that our salvation was owing never to us, all to him. What about innocent people? Scripture tells us there are none. The only way to become innocent is to be covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. What about uh, people who are sincere non-believers? They're sincere in their practice and faith and worship of other gods. Um, again, you have to recognize the pervasive nature of sin, the deceptive na nature of sin, how terrible it really is. What do we say about those who are sincere non-believers? Is that they're sincerely lost. They've been deceived by sin like we all were deceived by sin. Um, we have to understand sin has devastated us. It is everywhere. It is on everything. Uh, we are utterly corrupt to the core. Uh, how does belief factor into all this. If it's God choosing his people, what about us when we choose God? A uh, belief in God, please hear me say this, is absolutely necessary. You are called to believe in Jesus Christ. You are called to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There is a call on your life to believe in Jesus Christ, but recognize that when you do believe in him, it was caused by God. It was a gift given to you from him. Uh, in John 3, uh, John the Baptist is talking to his disciples and he says, um, uh, well, how does he describe it? He says, um, every good gift, I can't think of the quotation right now, forgive me for it, but it essentially says, um, I'm trying to quote it verbatim. A man cannot even receive a good thing unless it is given to him from heaven. Do you hear what he said? He said, a man cannot even receive a good thing unless it is given from heaven. What he's saying is, not only does God give us a gift, but God gives us the ability to reach out and take it. That is a gift from the Lord. So should you believe? Yes, absolutely. 100%. You should believe in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you have to recognize that as a gift from God. Uh, it is he who wills and works in us to receive that which he has given us. Uh, this is so that none would boast is what Galatians talks about, Philippians talks about, Romans talks about. Uh, so that none of us in here could say, I believe because I'm smarter than my neighbor. I believe because I'm um, just a better person than my brother. No, you were saved because God is good and in his grace he reached out and redeemed your soul. Period. You were, as far as you and I are concerned, the worst sinners we've ever known. God in his grace reaches down and redeems some, all owing to him and we should believe. God is sovereign. Man is responsible for his decisions. Respond in your decisions as though God is sovereign. This gets us to the question of, what about evangelism? Uh, if it's all up to God, really, why should we go and share our faith? Uh, if really God's the one who decides these things, whether people are saved or not, why should we go out and share? 
Um, one thing I'll draw your attention to is explanation of salvation never excuses exhortation to believe and be saved and to go and share salvation with others. Um, there's a scene in uh, Batman the Dark Knight, greatest superhero movie of all time. This is the one with the Joker and Heath Ledger. You guys remember this one? There's a scene where someone comes to, um, to uh, what's his name? Something Fox. Uh, it, there's a scene where someone comes to Morgan Freeman. And Morgan Freeman knows that Batman is also Bruce Wayne. And this accountant who works for Bruce Wayne all of a sudden discovers who the real Bruce Wayne is. He discovers that he's black, Batman. So he comes to Morgan Freeman and he says, listen, I know who the real Batman is. And unless I get $10 million a year, I'm going to tell the world. I know who the real Batman is. It's Bruce Wayne. And if the world knows this, it's going to go crazy. So I want $10 million. I want to blackmail Bruce Wayne. I want $10 million a year or I'm talking. And Morgan Freeman looks across his desk at this young accountant. He says, so let me get this straight. The man you work for, who knows who you are, where you come from, how to find you, is a masked vigilante who goes around at night snatching people up in the darkness. And you want to blackmail that guy? And you just see on the accountant's face like, oh, I did not think about that at all. Um, if the accountant really understood who Batman was, he would never attempt to blackmail him. If you truly understand the sovereignty of God and that salvation is all up to him and you realize how extensive and how powerful and how mighty and how high and lifted up he is in the fact that he chooses people and you then use that doctrine against him to dismiss what he's called you to do, which is to go and share your faith. If you put your hands in your pockets and say, well, God's sovereign, it's really up to him and he'll save people. So therefore I can ignore his instruction. You do not understand the sovereignty of God. You do not understand how extensive his character is. You would not cross him if you truly knew him. If you ever use election, predestination, the sovereignty of God to dismiss the commands of God. If you ever use the explanations around salvation to dismiss the exhortation for salvation, you are grossly misunderstanding election, predestination, the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, and your own calling in your relationship with him. You do not understand God. This is not something we use against God. This is actually something that motivates us and empowers us to go forward. When you understand that in sharing with your friend, neighbor, relatives, that ultimately their salvation is not up to them, but it's owing to God. What that allows you to have is it allows you to have hope. Because now you can go and plead on their behalf that God might save their souls. You're not just trying to convince them with the best possible argument you have so that they will maybe say, yeah, I believe in Christ. You're saying, oh, please, just I will share with you and God will open up your eyes. And indeed, oftentimes, that's exactly what he does. Um, the reason every time... In scripture, where scripture talks about election or predestination, it always does so for our comfort, not just not our confusion, which means this, if you're not comforted by this doctrine, you don't yet see it right. My encouragement to you is this is a very steep and hard doctrine to sw swallow. Took me a year to get it down. If you talk to Patrick Patterson, took him about the same. Everyone else I've talked to, it takes about a year of stomaching it and seeing it in the scriptures to embrace it. Not only is true, but beautiful. My encouragement to you is um, don't pass this up. Don't miss this. This is given for your comfort. What this is essentially saying, as we'll see in a little bit, is you did nothing to get yourself saved, so there's nothing you can do to undo your salvation. God was after your heart from the beginning of time. Praise God for that. Uh, not only um, does explanation never excuse exhortation, but in the words of John Hanna, I just encourage you with this. Uh, this is gold to me. I've been thinking about this and meditating on this a while. But um, think about this. When God appoints an end, it will happen. But God always appoints a means to that end. You may be, very well be the appointed means to someone's salvation. Someone will be saved, and God has actually factored you into the mix to bring it about. Um, why should we go and share our faith if it's all up to God? God invites us in to participate in it, if you will, to share in it with him, so that your friend, your brother, your neighbor, your mother, your father, people in the community who are led to Christ, are led to Christ somehow through you? An infinite gift given through a finite being? you got to be kidding me. Praise God for that. Um, there are many things that we can learn from election, but essentially what Scripture wants us to know this is that God chooses his people, and if God did not choose his people, his people would never choose him. Um, the, the state of man's 
soul is so utterly decrepit. It doesn't just describe us as blind. It doesn't just describe us as deaf and as lame and as, um, as stubborn. You know how scripture describes us? As dead. We need someone to come and revive us, to come and resurrect us. That's what this doctrine is talking about. That is the doctrine of election, predestination, or doctrines of grace, if you're not familiar. Uh, not always easy to stomach. Uh, please feel free to ask questions if you've got them, and we can wrestle with this in the text. I just want to show you that it is in the text, and it is uh, ultimately a beautiful thing when we learn to see it for what it is. So that's election. God chooses people. But now we talk about justification. We don't have to spend as much time here because we talk about this a lot, but justification is God redeeming his people. We see this in Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. We just read this. It says this, in him that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. Listen, this is true of you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. This is true of you. In Christ, you have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of your trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon you in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things that you, the things in heaven and on earth, unto himself. Justification is God coming to the field and saying, I will pay the debt that is owed on this lot and I will now own it myself. Whereas before we talked about what was slapped on our forehead due to what Adam had done um, on our behalf was guilty. Now, because Christ has purchased and redeemed us on the cross, it now says innocent and righteous son or daughter of the king. Uh, that is what justification is. Now, we have some questions about this, like, well, on the cross or through justification, what debts were paid? Um, when were the debts paid? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I think about Old Testament saints who died before Christ came about and they never knew him. What about them? Are they saved? And how does that whole thing work out? Um, what debts are paid? If you have a Catholic background, this could be helpful for you, for you because this is where, um, candidly, the Catholic Church has erred in their ways in the fact that they say, uh, on the cross, Christ paid for your past sins and your present sins, but not your future sins. But one thing I draw your attention to is when Jesus Christ died on the cross, all of your sins were future sins. All of them were paid for. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, not only is it that your past sins have been forgiven, your present sins have been forgiven, who you are has been forgiven, but even your future sins as well. In other words, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God does not walk around following behind you saying, when are you going to get it right? When are you going to pay me back for all the things you've done? It is forgiven to telestai. It is finished, paid in full. You have been redeemed, not owing unto yourself, but by the grace of God. What debts are forgiven? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, all of them. God no longer holds you accountable for all the things you've done wrong or will do wrong. Because you're now the son and he's purchased you. Um, when are the debts paid? Uh, they were paid for on the cross when Jesus Christ gave up his soul and he paid the ultimate price for us. And they're applied to us upon our belief. Now, this is something that's interesting because it's a little bit different than the Old Testament saints. Uh, the Old Testament saints, if you will, were redeemed upon their belief, but that, be but that redemption wasn't paid for until Christ died on the cross. Oftentimes, you'll hear the question, um, how were Old Testament saints saved if they didn't know who Jesus Christ was? You guys know the difference between a debit card and a credit card? Uh, a debit card and a credit card, they look very similar. Uh, these are both Visa cards. The number on the first one is 4167. <laughs> Someone's like, oh, I'm going to start taking notes, yeah. Um, <clears throat> they're, uh, you know the difference between a debit card and a credit card? They look very similar, right? I mean, you, you can't even tell which is which from where you're sitting. Um, both of them will pay for something at Safeway, but the difference is uh, when and how the money is transitioned and the um, charge is satisfied. Um, you and I were saved on debit. On the cross, money was put in the bank, if you will, when Jesus Christ died. Upon our belief, uh, that was when we swiped our card, if you will, and the money was transferred over and our debts were paid for. Oh, we were saved on debit. Old Testament saints were saved on credit. How does credit work? You swipe the card, the um, payment is given, but the money hasn't been transitioned or transferred until Christ dies on the cross. You and I were saved on debit. The Old Testament saints were saved on credit. Everyone was saved by having faith in God, us, Christ, having been able to put a name for it, the Old Testament saint looked for a day, looked at God, and longed for the day when God would come and redeem them. You and I are saved on debit. They are saved on credit. It can kind of be helpful when we're processing through what we see in the Old and New Testament. 
Um, what is justification? It is God redeeming his people. It is him purchasing your field. It is a legal standing, it is a legal transition that adjusts your standing before God from guilty to innocent and righteous, a son of God. Praise God for it. And it's just one step in the salvation process. That's justification. Now let's talk about sanctification. Uh, if justification is God redeems his people, sanctification is God refines his people. He's purchased the field. Now he goes to work on it. He begins to de-weed it, if you will. Sanctification is the process of God refining his people, of him um, empowering us by his spirit and whittling away at the weeds in our life, at the sin in our life, at the issues in our life uh, until we go home to glory and glorification. A good text for this is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, which reads like this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is your not, look, look at this, and this is not your own doing. So by grace, saved through faith. Okay, that, that's awesome. I, I had faith. And this is not your doing. It is the gift of God not as, as a result of works, so that no one should boast. If you're saved in this room, it's not because you believed when other people didn't. It's because God believed on your behalf and he came and he got you. That's what this is talking about. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created now in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. So this huge aspect of sanctification is God coming and redeeming our field, pulling up the weeds and inviting us to participate in that as well. He's got good things planned for you. He wants to remove the bad and empower you to the good. He wants to, to use another biblical concept, he wants to bring about fruit in your life that he has prepared for your life ahead of time. This is what is called sanctification. Now, oftentimes when it comes to sanctification, we have a question and it's this, who's responsible for sanctification? Uh, oftentimes we think, you know, Christ died on the cross. He gave me grace. And now it's my job to work um, out that salvation with fear and trembling. To, um, to work out that, gr to, in response to his gracious provision, now work that out in my life and de-weed the clutter in my life, the issues that I have in my life. Um, or is it all up to God and I just sit back and let him sanctify me? So our question is, is who's responsible for sanctification? Who does the working? Is it God or is it man? Is it him or is it me? Uh, fortunately for us, Philippians will weigh in on this question. Take a look at this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, ready? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So we ask the question, who is responsible for this? Is sanctification all about God or is it about me? And this text tells us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so I walk away from that saying, okay, it's all about me. All right, this is, he was gracious on the cross. Now, in light of that, I'm going to respond accordingly. I'm going to start tilling the weeds in my field, if you will. But then the text goes on. Look at this. For it is God who works in you, both to will and and to work his good pleasure. So it's saying right here, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is all up to you. It, almost kind of what it says. It's, it's up to you is the impression that it gives us. But then it follows it up with, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work his good pleasure. This isn't just saying that God um, helps you as you're doing it. It says that he gives you the desire to get you out in the field to want to do it. So our question is, sanctification, is it all about God? Is it about man? Is it something passive or is it something active? And the answer is, it's both. It's get out there, till the soil, work alongside God as he redeems your life and recognize that even the things that you do in your life are the gracious gift of God. Both the bad things you're remedying, the good things that you're bringing about. Uh, another question I have for sanctification is, um, well, by what means does God redeem us, uh, refine us, I should say. Um, by what means is he doing this? Scripture tells us of a few. This can be really helpful. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest ways that God actually refines you is by this right here, the church. This does not mean a building. This does not mean a program. This actually means other believers. Um, this is, <clears throat> this is kind of crazy. Uh, have you guys ever heard that proverb that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I used to love that verse. I used to really enjoy it because I used to think about it. It's like, that. what that means is when Duff, Pace, and I get together, we mutually edify each other in the word. We walk away sharper and stronger. When me and my wife get married, iron sharpens iron. We come together and we'll just love one another in this harmonious fellowship forever and we'll be refined in our character. Do you know what that verse is actually talking about? 
how is, this is Wallowa County, you guys understand metal smithing, working, <laughs> making, making, making things with metal? You guys understand this? How is metal sharpened and refined? Uh, iron sharpens iron by you heat the iron up and then you smack it as hard as you possibly can with another piece of iron. That's how iron sharpens iron. And so what that's actually describing is it's actually saying through the conflict that we have with one another, God is actually refining us as we trust in him. He heats us up and then he smashes us together. I can't think of a better way to describe the church, all right? A lot of people avoid church because what do they say? Oh, there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of drama. There's a lot of difficulty. There's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of strife. And so it's just better for me to stay at home. But what scripture is drawing our attention to is no, that's the process by which God refines us. As we're all pointing towards him, as we're all trusting in him, there is heat, there is conflict, but it is what will refine our character. Half of the New Testament is dedicated towards encouraging other believers to recognize that we will sin against one another, but that we're called to love one another despite our sin. And in doing so, that will be what whittles away at the sin that we have in our life. One of the best and biggest ways that God refines us is actually through the conflict that we have with one another. So my encouragement to you is when you have conflict in this body and another body, I don't know where you're from or where you're at. My encouragement to you is don't give up. That is how God is refining you. It hurts just like marriage hurts, but it's refining your character over time if you trust in him. One of the biggest ways that God sanctifies us, that he refines our character, is by putting us in conflict with other individuals who have skills and gifts and burdens that we need to bear. And over the process of time, he whittles away the weeds in our field as we work with one another to help one another without one another's other fields, if you can follow that logic. So one of the biggest ways God sanctifies us is through the church. Another way is through spiritual disciplines. This is getting in our Bibles. This is praying. This is fasting. This is trusting him. This is, I will say it in the biggest way I can, this is getting in your Bible. That is the way his word refines us. Almost above and beyond anything else I can think on this list, scripture primarily talks about his word is what refines us. If you want to be sanctified, if you're tired of looking at the weeds in your life, get into his word. That is his primary means of actually sanctifying us. Uh, but not only is it our spiritual disciplines, but also God's discipline. If you guys remember in John 15, we talked about uh, the Lord prunes those. He disciplines his children. He prunes the branches that are in him. Uh, this means oftentimes suffering, challenge, difficulty. Uh, it is all God's way of pruning us. And actually what scripture tells us is that uh, Romans 8, 28, for all things work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Through all things going on in your life, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're trusting him, he is sanctifying you through that process. Sometimes, I don't know if you've ever done this, but sometimes when I actually get out to my lawn, which my lawn looks terrible, which is why this whole thing is on my mind. Um, when I get out to my lawn, I start working on it. And it's only when I start working on it that I actually realize how terrible it really is. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the one patch of green that I have isn't actually grass. It's a bunch of dandelions. You know what I'm saying? Um, oftentimes in our sanctification process, uh, we, as we go hand in hand with God, we look at it and we say, oh man, it's a losing battle. It's going to be one step forward and two steps back. My encouragement to you is trust him. What his word says is that through time he will be refining and making his people, as he says here, holy and blameless before himself. Trust him. Um, he invites us and involves us in the work um, by his grace. This is one of his means of grace. This is a part of the process of salvation. But then there is the final part, which is the glorification. This is God not just buying your field, not just working the weeds, but one day him turning it into a garden that will glorify himself forever. Uh, this is uh, brought about by either the second coming of Christ or by our death and our transition into eternity where eventually he lights us up like a Christmas tree and we share in his glory. Listen to how Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 describes this. But God, being rich in mercy, my question for you is, how rich is God? How rich is God? What does he not own or possess? How rich is God? Because that is the way in which he describes the mercy that he has poured out upon your head with all of his riches. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved and raised he and he raised us up with him and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable 
riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. If you're a believer in this room, that's what you have to look forward to. The immeasurable riches of God poured out upon your head as you sit. I can't even believe it. I can utter this. It's what scripture says. As we sit right alongside Jesus Christ himself. I would be happy just to be in the cheap, cheap seats 100 miles away just to look at him. And he says, come up and sit beside me. That is the glorification that we're one day looking forward to when we uh, leave this life and have eternal life in him forever. Uh, that is um, glorification in a nutshell. Still leads us to a few different questions, which perhaps the biggest is this when it comes to salvation. Um, can my salvation be lost? Is it once saved, always saved? Or does this mean that, you know, um, I, I kind of go in and out? Sometimes I believe, sometimes I don't, and I, I acquire it, and then I lose it. Um, can salvation be lost? My encouragement to you is just to recognize the order of salvation and everything that's involved in it. Um, this is why the doctrine of election, the doctrine of grace, is so comforting because essentially what it says is it says, you never did anything to earn your salvation, so what makes you think you could ever do anything to unearn it? God never came and consulted you and said, would you really like to be saved? He says, I am saving you. And the way that scripture describes it is that he puts us in the palm of his hand and he says, nothing can bring you out of this. In fact, we see this in um, Romans 8, which reads like this. Just listen to this. Let these words wash over you. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. It actually speaks of that in the past tense. That is how assured your salvation is, is that God already speaks into it as though it has already happened. You've already been glorified. That is how fixed it is. Verse 31. So what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What this text is saying is God slaughtered his son for you. What makes you think that he's not going to be constant in his pursuit of your salvation after that? If he would offer up his one son to save you, what makes you think he said, oh man, I just can't maintain it. Who is to condemn Sorry, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. When we talked about the high priestly prayer, we talked about how God is pleading on our behalf. Why is that good news? Because God always gets what God wants. And what does God want? He wants constancy in your faith. And that's exactly what he will get. If he wants you, he will get you. There's nothing you can do to get out of that. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. And all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to read that again. It answers our question, can I lose my salvation? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. You are a part of creation, so nothing in creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can you lose your salvation? No. God has bound himself to you. He has promised on his own. He is... Um, appealing to his own person when he promised to save you and he will deliver on his promises. Praise God. Um, can salvation be lost? No. You didn't earn it, so there's nothing you can do to unearn it. It is God's grace to you. Uh, is it once saved, always saved? That's a tricky phrase. This once saved, always saved. Sometimes this makes us think we just pray the prayer and now we're saved. Um, the way that scripture would actually describe it is this. Truly saved, always saved. We're not just saved by a prayer. We're saved by what Scripture calls us to, which is what we talked about in our epistles of John, conversation. Uh, believing what God believes about himself, 
loving what God loves, doing what God calls us to do as evidence of our faith. Um, if you are truly saved, you are always saved. We're not just saved by a prayer that we pray. And um, our question is, what security, if any, do we have? And the answer is God himself is our security. Or who will separate us from the love of God? Neither height nor depth, angels, powers, things present, things to come. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Um, that is the what, when, who, how, and why of salvation. Uh, it's just, it's a crash course. It's a little microscopic look at it. This is one text um, informed by others. Um, my question or encouragement to you is um, now maybe this, since we're talking about being saved, are you saved? Have you believed upon the person and work of Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him? Have you turned to him and say, I recognize that um, I was lost in sin. I'm an enemy of God, but I'd like to be reconciled back to him. Can you help me with that? Will you save me? And what you'll find is even when you pray that prayer, um, when you just ask the question, he's already at work in your heart, and he's already ransomed your soul back to himself. For you would not even want to be saved by him unless you already were. Um, yeah. Sometimes we look at this. Um, well, no, that's for another time. How about that? That is the who, what, when, where, why, and how of salvation. Um, it, it, I, I, today I felt um, in preparation, I was asking the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, will you give me a soft tone in approaching this? Because this is actually supposed to be comforting to us and encouraging, not just like boom, you know what I mean? Um, but I felt kind of like I was describing a, a rock or a fortress or um, a fort, some impenetrable mountain. I felt like I couldn't get around that tone, if you will, because that's what we were describing. Um, so if today you're put back or if, you're, um, if this doesn't sound comforting to you, my encouragement to you would be um, we're describing the fortress. The fortress is designed to be robust and strong so that we can find refuge in it find comfort and encouragement in it, if that makes sense. Um, so my encouragement to all of us would be, um, if this conversation is daunting or confusing or not comforting to us, we're not yet seeing it correctly. Um, and my encouragement to you would be, continue to press into his word. Beg of him that he might show you these things in order that you might be comforted by the robust um, fortress that we've described today. Does that make sense? Here's what we're going to do. I'd love to pray for us, and we'll continue to reflect on these things as we sing praises to God and worship. Let's pray. Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Lord, I ask that you pour out your mercy upon our heads that we might see you, taste you, trust you, treasure you above all things and in all ways. Uh, Lord, as we've talked about many a times through your word, um, you demand from us perfection. You demand from us innocence and righteousness, things we cannot provide for ourselves. But Lord, we recognize in your word that you always provide what you require. You supply what you demand. And so, Lord, um, we ask that you do just that. If you would have us properly appreciate um, our salvation and the gift that you've given us through your son, uh, if you would require that of us, we ask that you please supply it. Open up our eyes to see you, you for how big and beautiful you really are. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.